Hey everybody, this is Carlos with another episode of CBTV and I'm here with Steve from ICPanalysis.com. How are you, Steve? All right, how are you, Carlos? Yeah, we're here in Denver. We decided to stop by his house and so we can, you know, ask him questions, have a little candid conversation about his thoughts on ICP analysis, you know, how to, what is ICP analysis, you know? But before we do that, give me, you know, introduce yourself. There's a little background of, of, of how did you get into the hobby and how did you get into ICP? Well, I've been in the fish hobby since I was eight years old. So, a very, very long time. And my background is applied math and chemistry. I worked in an analytical lab 20 years ago, radiochemistry, so everything with radiation, doing tech stuff for testing iodine, strontium, thorium, all sorts of different radioactive elements. And I always loved the, the laboratory and instrumentation field. And when I graduated, I started up a business doing formulation work for companies and private labeling. So I formulated everything from household cleaners, industrial cleaners, personal care products. Years ago, I just decided to take my hobby of saltwater fish and move forward into a few different areas. And a few years ago, I decided to buy an ICP to analyze uh, aquarium water. Once I got the ICP and got it up and going and running, and I've now tested water from around the world. Now I go and I take water samples uh, from aquarium and I try to mimic the natural ocean. And ICP is great for testing your calcium, magnesium, potassium, but we don't really need it for that. It's overkill. It's a precision instrument that we don't need to test those items for. It's meant for your trace elements, your zinc, iron, strontium, iodine, uh, boron, bromine, things to that effect. That's where we want to know what's going on. How are we going to balance those out? There aren't any good kits on the market to test those. Um, ICP is the best option at this time. Now, there's many things to mimic the ocean, you know, like alkalinity and nitrogen levels and sunlight and water flow, but you know, we're able to do that pretty well with a bunch of other things on the market. But if you want to really get your fine tune and get your coloring and get your coral growth, you want the ICP and you want to do it on a regular basis, uh, you know, if you want to do that too. So, one great way that we started stuff off is we would test tanks couple times a week. In the beginning, we wanted to test to find out where's the baseline, where is everything at. And then we raised the water level uh, on the micro elements up to uh, a certain level. And then we're testing again a few days later to see how fast the corals are absorbing it. And then through the process of doing this over the period of a month, we're able to find out what is the balance, you know, how fast is the corals absorbing, for instance, iodine, strontium, and some of the other trace elements that were of interest that bring out the coral colors. And then you start phasing it down to testing once a week. Mm -hmm. And then you can go down to once every two weeks as you have a baseline of where stuff is so that you're checking and keeping up of whether the corals are sucking up more or less and you adjust your dosing application that way. And from that, I've been able to actually, in several tanks, take coral growth to really what's really close to what Mother Nature does in the ocean. Because uh, I was able to mimic lighting really well, temperature, alkalinity, and wave motion. And then the final right. step was to put it all together and get a stabilized aquarium. And after, a month of doing stuff, you start noticing the difference. The aquarium starts to stabilize because it has all of its nutrients that it needs. And once it realizes it has the nutrients that it needs, the trace elements, it's not constantly struggling to have and contract, and it's not exerting energy in areas that it doesn't need to. It can calm down and focus on putting the coloring and growth out on stuff. You're looking to see that swing, you know, um, yes. So you can't really just test once for ICP and, and, and call it a day because then you're just you're you're not taking advantage of the full of the full benefits of it. No, the benefits is to go test often, 
so you can see the ups and downs and then you can tweak you can add a little you know your your iron went down so much then add more iron so you're, you're it's, again it's all about balance well iron is a bad example oh, okay and i'm going to say that just because iron typically gets absorbed in your aquarium 12 to 16 hours after adding it mm -hmm. same with zinc zinc is absorbed really fast in the system and so those are sort of we don't want to tell people that you're going to see iron and keep on adding because the moment you actually start seeing uh, iron showing up on your ICP testing, you know you've got too much in it because the corals can't take it up and then it's going to start causing problems at some point. There are some trace elements that we don't want to do that with. We just want to know that it's down at zero and we add uh, so often. Okay. And but most of them aren't that way. There's only two that I know of right now that are zinc and iron that suck it up really fast. Mm -hmm. Even the way you add the trace elements to your tank has a lot to do. There's yeah. a proper way of doing it and there's a, an incorrect way of doing it. You don't ever want to add it directly into the tank. You're, for instance, zinc and iron are prime examples. They're metals. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they get sucked up so fast, uh, the, it, corals and these metals are like magnets to each other. They just grab hold of it. And you get toxic levels all of a sudden uh, when you just dump it right into the middle of the tank without it having a chance to dilute down and mix up. Mm -hmm. So say it gets dumped into the tank and your power head grabs it and shoots it right in to your corals. The corals grab hold of it. They got a toxic level of it. And it then starts to kill the coral. So, the ideal place to put stuff is inside your sump where it has time to start getting diluted and mixed up before getting blasted into your aquarium at a full concentrate. Mm -hmm. um, I know some of us have had the issue where all of a sudden a coral starts to RTN or STN and you know it's hard to make that connection between oh, three days later or, or yesterday I added trace elements and it just happens that I added them in a way that it the flow just took it right into that acro and all of a sudden today the acro is half dead half dead and yeah. you know it doesn't necessarily mean that there's something wrong with the system it's just you might have made a mistake you might have made a mistake and, and we all make mistakes there's no wrong there yeah. which brings me to the next question um uh, when is it a good time to test for ic to, to test your water with icp if your tank is looking really good and happy that's a good time to test and take a look at your values and see where they are because uh, systems are constantly changing. So if we look at when the system is really happy, it gives you a baseline of what you like, what your corals like, mm -hmm. uh, where it's sort of established down to. So you can then try to maintain that level to keep it happy. Corals love consistency, which is why it's important to always keep your alkalinity, calcium, and magnesium as stable as possible. But if we don't take a look at the trace elements, that's a completely whole new thing because you've got 10 trace elements that, you know, roughly that are very important that we're adding. And we want to make sure that that stays stable too because those are the little things that add our color, add the extra tissue growth, and help with the energy and metabolisms to do what the corals need to do to grow. Just because it has calcium, magnesium, and alkalinity doesn't mean it's gonna to wanna to grow. Mm -hmm. It needs its vitamins too, you know, vitamins and minerals. So while well, the trace elements are not the vitamins, they're the minerals that they need. Mm -hmm. And we just think of the macro site because that's all we used to be able to test for. Mm -hmm. Now we can test all the trace stuff too. And we can have, you know, reliable results to add and dose and there are several good products out there that tell you how to on the label how to dose and it gives you a couple different ways of dosing and that's been a real game changer out there if something is amiss then i can always go back to my baseline and say okay my corals were doing really well here they're not doing so well here what's the difference and then you make adjustments and our website and our app log in all your test that you do. So if you do a test, you'll always be able to go back to the date that you pulled that sample 
and look at the values and see what it was. Or you can compare it to the locations we've tested across the world mm -hmm. and even values that we put out uh, that we keep our tank at. Uh, and I've shown some videos on our Facebook page of uh, a test tank that I was doing of just pure acros and the coloring and growth that we got off of it. And these are the values I've discovered that were very beneficial. What works for you? What do you, what do you keep your tank at? Unlike a lot of traditional things, I've looked at natural ocean water. I honestly like to keep my calcium levels around 400. Uh, natural seawater uh, in Fiji, Hawaii, and a few other locations between 4 and 4, 400 and 415. Uh, I like to keep my potassium levels around 380. I like to keep my magnesium levels around 1325 to 1350. Um, then with iodine, I like to keep iodine levels at 0.05 parts per million up to 0.08. It's on the high side from what most people are used to seeing, but I discovered that a little bit higher on it, we actually got more uh, color pulled out on uh, our corals. I saw Walt Disney's and Home Records just when I was doing higher levels of iodine, the pinks on it just came out in really nice ways. It just, they were absolutely gorgeous. And strontium, minimum I keep is at 10 parts per million and I go as high as 14. Um, I really don't like to go higher than that, but I like to keep it pretty tight. I mean, I, my ideal range is 12, but you know, I would fluctuate a little bit between 10 and 14. Uh, but if I tested enough on it, I could keep it at 12 pretty good. Same thing with iodine, I could keep it at certain levels pretty easy uh, once I found out how fast things were uh, soaking up inside the corals. So those are some of the things that people really pay attention to. Alkalinity wise, I like seven, eight to eight. It's a little bit higher than natural seawater, but it also gives a little safety buffer in case there's a problem with the tank and your alkalinity drops down a little bit. You're still within the safety margin of what's good because when you start getting below seven, they say it's bad. I've seen differences and everyone will see some differences in corals, but it's the big change that uh, shocks corals that they don't like. So I see a lot of tremendous growth and happiness with all forms of coral softies, uh, LPS and SPS at seven, eight to eight. And that's just my personal preference. I like that. That's what I do all my testing on and focus on keeping my corals at. Recommendations in, the test, in terms of testing. Start with twice a week, three times a week, and then work your way up to? Two to three times a week is good. Um, I think twice a week is very sufficient for most people when they're having to mail it in. Mm -hmm. Because you wanna, I would probably first start off of getting a baseline of seeing, send off one test, get a baseline see where it is, raise the level up, because if you haven't been adding very much, it's probably not going to change too much in the time it gets to us and we do the test. Mm -hmm. Then you add, let it mix up for you know an hour or two, mm -hmm. grab another test, then two to three days later, grab another one so you can see what type of consumption starts to occur. So two to three days later, you grab water before you add the chemicals because you Correct, do, yeah. because you want to know before you know the dose because you want to you want to start seeing how fast your corals are starting to absorb. Mm -hmm. So that's when you're getting stuff. The first time that you're running the test, you want to know where your level is before you start to add. Mm -hmm. You then raise your levels up with whichever product you choose, and then after that, you're waiting a few days to see how fast something starts to get absorbed. And that's why you're then sending off two samples then. Then after that, it's still good to test, you know, the following week. Test it twice during that week to see what happens. After you've got your results, you know you raise it up a little bit more, then you wait a few more days, and you do that for about a month. Okay. 
And through the course of a month, you're going to get a pretty good idea of how fast stuff is going. And then when a month hits, your tank will have settled down also a little bit, and it will be a lot happier. Now, to also make a point, it really helps if your alkalinity stays really stable during that time too. The more stable your alkalinity is, the lot, uh, the better the ICP test is going to work because the coral isn't exerting energy trying to balance with your alkalinity, you know, going up and down, up and down. It's the same thing. If we can keep our alkalinity and calcium magnesium relatively stable, then we're able to then balance out our trace elements and it really just goes. All right, and then after a month, you reduce to once a week? Yeah, about once a week is between somewhere around four to eight weeks of testing a couple times a week, we drop down to once a week. Okay. Because you've got a baseline you can see, and then at, during that one week time, we test, and it's pretty easy to see where we've been dosing everything as a general rule, how much we've been dosing, if we need to increase our dose or drop our dose down, because as the pearls start getting larger and a little bit bigger, you realize you have to start adding a little bit more to keep your desired uh, level. Just because, you know, a product on the shelf says, add so much every day to your tank, that's, you know, the Mickey Mouse dosing. We want to, ICP is about taking the dosing and knowing what your dosing is accurate. So you grab the product and if it says this much is going to raise your tank up in iodine by 0.01 parts per million, you know, if you find that your tank is dropping 0.02 parts per million every week, you need to be adding that much in the course of the week in order to maintain it and keep the level up. Because the one thing you don't want is for any of your trace elements to drop down to zero or really close to zero where it can't really grab it at all because it doesn't ever come across it or it's just too hard to grab it. So Every tank is different. Every coral, you know, the size of the corals and if you have frags or if you have colonies, the demand is different. Correct. The is demand changes the based on how big and how many corals are in there. So that's why you have to go off of the numbers. You know, if you see that your iodine dropped 0.02 parts, then you just know that you need to add 0.2 parts per million to it. But you don't just add 0.02 parts per million every week just because you think it needs it. You do it because you've seen a history and a trend of how it's going. And how easy it is to um, do the ICP tests? I mean, it's easy. You get the kit. You go online and you register, and then after you complete your registration, you log into it, create your aquarium. It gives you a nine-digit unique test ID number, mm -hmm. and this nine-digit number is unique to every test every time you run it. Mm -hmm. That test ID number is what we pay attention to, and we type that into the machine. We honestly don't pay attention to customers' names or anything that are put on there, because it's that nine-digit number we care about. That's what's related to your account when you log in and register and create your test. So after you've got your nine digit number, you put it on your vial, you put your water into the vial, put it into the Ziploc bag, put it back in the box, and you can ship it either US Postal Service, FedEx, or UPS. It's gonna to come to Lakewood, Colorado, Denver, Colorado. The product doesn't degrade. Okay. You know, we're not shipping radiation, it's not going to degrade, it's not going to break down. Even during the winter when it's like incredibly cold, does, yeah. does freezing affect the water? No, because as long as it, uh, we make sure it's defrosted and that things are shook up sufficiently. And once it, the sample gets injected into a 10,000 degree ball of plasma, we're breaking apart all chemical bonds. So just to look at the elements, we don't care about what's called compounds. We don't care about that, we care about the elements. And so we're breaking all the chemical compounds. So as long as we're in a liquid form, we're good to go. Well, Steve, we'd like to thank you for your time. I mean, we've learned quite a bit. And I think uh, um, you've explained the process, but at the same time, which is what we really appreciate and all the audience appreciates, is that you've given us some food for thought and some tips about how to do things properly and explain ICP. I think most people, or even myself, I was guilty of it. I thought of ICP just as a one-time deal. I also thought of ICP as um, 
only having the need to test when things are not doing too well, instead of testing when everything is doing great, and uh, and then creating that baseline. So we really appreciate that.